Welcome everybody uh, for this uh, opening keynote panel of the Atelier for Arts and Production Managers, which has started today, um, which is organized in partnership with Elefsis 2023, Drossos Foundation, Artlink and Zukak Theatre Company. We have with us here uh, 26 participants coming from different countries in MENA region, Mediterranean and um, Balkan countries uh, to encourage a regional exchange. So we, we want to learn more about each other. We have a panel here with us uh, representing the different regions uh, that are also um, part of our uh, participants who will talk about um, the economic, social, cultural reality within their context. So mainly to um, learn about how these different contexts operate. We have with us Wafa Belgakem, Theron Ada, Mikael Marmarinos, Omar Abi Azar, and Deo Vidavich. So I'll hand over the floor to Mike van Graan, who will facilitate um, this session today. There is more information to be found on all the speakers in their biographies on our website. Um, where the panel is also being live streamed and on our Facebook and Instagram pages. Great, thanks very much Inge. So the panel is very much about providing some kind of a framework for the different regions that are represented within this particular atelier. The atelier is about promoting international regional collaboration and people working together on creative projects and so in order for us to do that, we need to understand the contexts in which we find ourselves in these different places at the moment. So the purpose of this panel is to provide us with some of that contextual location. We're going to have each of the speakers basically talk to us for about 10 minutes, setting the context in their particular countries, and then we'll facilitate a conversation between them and invite the participants in the atelier to ask questions and to pose comments as well. And the order in which we're going to be doing this is uh, Michael from Greece will start. We'll then follow with Dea Vidovic, who's based in Croatia. And we'll go to Siran in Turkey after that. And then we'll go down to Tunisia with Wafa Belkacem. And we'll end up with Omar in Lebanon. So Mikhail, over to you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to have you here, all of you, and hosting you in a way in Ellipsis, uh, which is supposed to be the cultural capital of Europe for 2023. I'm the new artistic director for the 2023 Ellipsis, um, which has been was which was supposed to take place in 2021 in Ellipsis. And it has been postponed to 2023 together with Timisoara for COVID reasons. The last year, second, the last year edition of the Hellenic Festival, the larger in terms of duration festival in Greece, was fully cancelled because of COVID reasons last summer. A small third, a small interesting cultural festival of Elefsina called Eschilia um, was fully cancelled last summer as well because of COVID reasons. I start with these not so uh, lovely information because unfortunately that stays the background of our discussions tonight. Absence, the lack of physicality. While festivities rely and owe a lot in the potentiality of physical presence, encounter, meeting other people as well as to the productive atmosphere that ensues directly from the performance of being. That seems to be the main issue of nowadays and for all kinds of festivals even for arts that can pretend to be COVID-free art forms like film, video, visual arts, etc. And this productive atmosphere 
that stems out from the physical co-presence um, and that emerges by the physical proximity, even if it's not possible to have an objective assessment, we all know and have experienced its essence and cruciality on the overall results. I would dare to say that one of the hidden invisible motives for the festivals is exactly this irreplaceable atmosphere of the physical coexistence. I need to stress it because there might be a danger of relying on the new realities of distancing. The technology, which seems to be a wonderful tool toward which we all feel grateful and thankful, otherwise we wouldn't be here now, might be a trap since it pretends to offer substitutes. So in a way, what we experience right now here by this moment reflects what difficulties almost all kinds of festival experience. Nevertheless, I don't want to complain. And by this chance, I really thanks technology for this privilege we are given to be together right now, this moment. B, as you already know, we host 2023 LFC's European Capital of Culture for 2023. LFC's or LFCNA is a small but historically and archaeologically flagship city just 21 kilometers far from Athens. Athens is the capital of Greece, for those who don't know it. We mostly define the feature of this city. What mostly defines the feature of this city is uh, its archaeological significance, as well as its tremendous explosion in industrialization already from the end of 19th century which went on also almost the whole 20th century till the 90s when the economical crisis started to emerge pushing things to enter a post-industrialization era. The industrialization worked as a desperate motive in the difficult times of those periods where surviving the poverty was an existential issue for the largest scale of the population of Greece. So by this opportunity, by this chance, a huge inner migration stream aroused and people from different regions come to LFCs for finding a better future. These people consist even now approximately the 85% of the inhabitants of the modern city. And they reflect a particularity in its features, 17 ethnographic communities, live and prosper in ellipses, maintaining their own fast and habits they used to perform in their homeland. This is the one, the one amount of, of, of uh, collectivities. There are also other collectivities which are more cultural. There is a, um, a collectivity of uh, film committee. There is also a, um, a photographic club and so on. There are many. And um, yeah, uh, we are all immigrants. I mean, this is a striking phrase that could characterize Lefsina in a way. And beyond that, beyond these people, there is also a camp with, with immigrants from Middle East and Asia, as well as an important Roma community in the suburbs of Lefsina. I'm mentioning all these because I find important to, to, to know, for you to know what society into which rich reigns of inhabitants, the festivities of this particular cultural capital is first of all addressed and in which scale we have to take it under serious consideration. Integration of all these branches is one of the main important challenges we confront. See, 
a city that has experienced the heavy industrial pollution for an enormous number of years, that now tries to reset the fundamental environmental qualities is a wonderful, difficult, risky, and productive challenge we undertake to confront together with the city. D. Searching now its role as a city full of archaeological and post-industrial monuments and ruins. In the realm of culture, faces similar issues with many European cities facing the unemployment of the post-industrial era and the era of recent crisis. So this city functions, could function as an experimental model. If it succeeds in some terms, it could offer a model, a model way for other cities of corresponding analogies. Now some challenges in bullets, if you allow me. A, one, we're facing reduced fundings because of COVID-19. In general, when we confront social crisis, here has a form, here in this case, we have, it has a form of a, a hygienic pandemic crisis. Culture here seems to be the easy target to cut off subsidies, finances, in a way reflecting the idea that art is a luxury. Two, motility reduced, we've already touched it. In an internationally oriented artistic program, but also in a national level, we all confront tremendous restrictions that raise an unpredictable obstacle in the core of the festival, which is the physical encounter. We but invest a lot in co-productions, national or international residencies, congresses, capacity building programs and so on, which we have to handle under a new circumstance, not so flashy as before. I make myself clear, we're a bit tired of the distance of Zoom meetings. It doesn't represent a newly bought toy in our hands as it was one year ago. That's a different we could find now from, from some time ago. Uh, three. Beyond this difficulty and taking it under consideration that no one can assure us about the situation we might have. We have to set up a program, interesting, international, national, flexible, and in a way incorporating unpredictability that defines our current days and the coming days. I have to confess that this is a very tricky mathematical code. For festival to my eyes and not only to mine, represent a peculiar spider net, a web where all the current deep, diverse needs, wounds and sensitivities of the humanity can be caught. And all the people that participate in such an encounter, they function consciously or subconsciously as ambassadors of good practices. Distributing to the rest of the world, the voice articulated. Festivals function as a positive virus, infecting us, and a huge amount of people afterwards with what they learned there on the spot that, that took place. And for me, in a way, that's the big loss for the moment. Five, LFCs was supposed to be the cultural capital of 21. You know that already. And uh, six, we, confront a weird situation here in LFCs. 
we have no indoors venues in our disposal yet. Maybe we have one, but it still is in discussion. Why there are many amazing, beautifully abandoned buildings from the former industrial period of the city. And we have, we exert a huge strive to regain a couple of them. That means that we, um, for the moment, we use as a theater, something that we anyway like and want to, the city itself as a big theater of itself, um, art in the public space, till we have the indoors venues that we need as well. Um, I'm just, uh, Mikhail, just maybe yeah, give I'm, you a minute warning, yeah? Thank you very much. Cool. I'm very on the edge to accomplish right. what I'm Thanks saying. I have, I have to go to have a PS, I want to confess something. Every time I encounter people, just like, just like right now, even in these Zoom circumstances, I cannot but bow in front of the richness I experience sharing things with you and being shared things by you. And then I, I take the inner advantage of wanting to externize them, to share them, to scream them out. This is what a festival is about. Excuse me to convert one phrase that I like very much. Um, real museum projects in life what is supposed to belong to death. The work is not an object, but a voice. I could say the same about festivals. Thank you for listening. Mikhail, thank you very much as our host for doing that opening. Um, we look forward to engaging more in the conversation a little bit later. Thea, over to you. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to be here with all of you tonight uh, and be a part of a panel with such a great speakers and a great moderator. Thanks for inviting me to join you at this opening plenary and share some of my thoughts and insights on social, cultural, political, and economic challenges within the cultural sector in Croatia and the wider. In my contribution, I will predominantly focus on the role and the position of civil society in culture as this is directly related to my position of the director of Cultura Nova Foundation, a public foundation established with the purpose of providing better condition for non-profit, non-governmental associations in contemporary arts and culture. To that end, my contribution will give an overview of the research that Cultura Nova conducted on the effects of pandemic and earthquake crisis on civil society sector in contemporary arts and culture here in Croatia, which is also the only scientifically validated data and insight into the crisis impact on cultural sector in Croatia. In 2020, I participated in many online events, as all of you probably, different webinars, seminars, conferences, that gather cultural experts from all over the world where the main starting points or conclusions were abandon the business as usual formula and do things differently. Basically, the main parole was, let's not go back to the old normal. Let's imagine and create a new normal for our future. So the key issue here is what was the problem with the old normal? Or I would rather ask what wasn't the problem with our normal in the past. Obsession with economic growth in culture, neoliberalization of welfare state, public policy, including cultural policy, democratic deficits and failures in contemporary cultural policies, rising nationalism, xenophobia, intolerance, and spectacularization that are all visible in culture 
commodification of cultural resources, inequality, issue of accessibility, and new forms of exclusionary paradigms, instrumentalization of participation, rising populism in culture, climate crisis, you name it. All these economic, political, social changes or pressure place a new demand on cultural actors artists, cultural managers, cultural institutions, and others all over the world, asking them to constantly reconsider and renegotiate their status, positions, and the role in the wider socioeconomic context. Among many challenges that are in front of creation civil society and culture, but also in Southeastern Europe region and Europe and the wider basically, I'm choosing to refer dominantly to working conditions as they have been underlined as the most pressing issues and applicable in different contexts as well. So many published studies and the policy documents in Europe have pointed to the fact that insecurity and non-standard works of work in the cultural sector have become frequent occurrences. Although the situation depends on, for example, EU member states, if we look only on that context of European Union and their legislation and regulatory frameworks due to the variety of legal frameworks for status of artists in Europe, generally speaking, in the last two decades, precariousness has become a standard for the cultural sector, especially for all artists and the cultural professionals who are self-employed, for whom uncertainty became inherent and potential source of stress, but also the only option for survival. So how did the civil society organization in culture become a precarious community in Croatia, post-socialist, post-war and post-Yugoslav country, country with new economic and political system, capitalism and democracy. So Croatian cultural policy model dominantly focused to public cultural institutions as a legacy of previous socialist system. If we look at the Croatian civil society organization from the historical perspective, we will see the shift from work primarily based on volunteerism and enthusiasm during the turbulent period of the 90s to the expansion, institutionalization and the professionalization of the civil sector from the beginning of 2000. So the expansion was the result of the reconstruction of the legal framework for NGOs that made their establishment much easier, and also to the adoption of the new law on cultural council that made the provision of financial support to NGOs in culture possible. The institutionalization was based on the growth of technical equipment of organizations, increasing of financial and the program capacities, diversification of financial resources, networking on national and the local level, as well as increasing international cooperation and advocacy actions. The professionalization was associated with the emergence of employment, as well as with the land and the intensity of work that could no longer be done in a leisure time. So the specific changes in the cultural system include the establishment of Cultura Nova Foundation, Another positive impact on financial diversification represented by European investment and structural funds that open after creation accession to the European Union. At the same time, civil society organizations are facing continuous budget cuts on the national and the local levels and the shrinking of physical spaces for their activities. Despite the potentiality for their further program development, paradoxically, civil society organizations reach their financial and organizational ceilings. The project logic work, which is the dominant in the civil sector, affects employees in this sector. As a result, these organizations have already been chronically exposed to unstable project and non-standard working conditions, and the state of crisis is their permanent state following by social insecurity. 
Looking at the current crisis caused by the coronavirus, but also earthquakes that have shaken Croatia in 2020 several times, Cultura Nova conducted the research on impact of COVID-19 and earthquakes on civil society organization and culture. Results confirm the initial assumption that the sector is under treat, but also capable of quickly and adequately reacting to crisis. So the research confirms that the fragility of the sector is reflected across organizational and program levels, including everyday routines of office works, spaces for production and distribution, education and discursive programs, income, travel and international collaboration. The circumstances that have directly affected the cultural sector by making it impossible or difficult to work also spilled over to several other sectors to which cultural and artistic organizations are connected, such as the transports, hotels, private accommodation, restaurants and bars, travel agencies, and so on. So the negative impact on the ecosystem shows the extent to which cultural organizations contribute every day to economic prosperity of the community and the whole society, among other things. So the resilience of civil society organization working in contemporary arts and culture was confirmed, or more precisely, their readiness to find solutions in times of crisis. A quick reaction and the ability to respond to the negative consequences of the crisis derive, as I explained earlier, from their permanently working in unstable condition which enables them to prepare quickly when facing a crisis, adapt and react to gradual changes or sudden disruptions in order to survive, recover and thrive. The fact that they are able to find a solution leading to a positive result is the consequences of the strategic imperative. This resilience is also derived from the nature of their organizational culture, which is a flexible and non-hierarchical, so that organizations are more adjustable and adapt for change. Their program resilience is the consequence of culture and artistic creativity with an inherent innovativeness approaches and ability to create new artistic practices and organizational responses. But however, the resilience of the organization is not a quality that should be relied on in the long term for further inadequate treatment of the non-institutional cultural sector by the public system and the cultural policy. Counting on resilience will potentially lead to deeply problematic and exploitative understanding of the role and systemic condition of the civil society sector in culture, but also in culture as a general. So in order for some of these changes to have positive effects on the entire cultural sector, it is necessary to consider them from different angles. First of all, to ensure more stable working condition in the cultural sector in general. This emerged as one of the key issues in the context of sustainable development goals and the new attempt by the European Union Commission to connect them to the cultural and creative sector in the future, when these goals should have a central place in the EU recovery plan. The mobility of artists, cultural professionals and cultural goods and international collaboration, which involves travel as the basic activity, will need some new modalities based on sustainable and green approach. So finally, I will end with a question to us all on why should the cultural sector keep this catastrophically dysfunctional system when it could be rendering, demanding, creating and implementing a systemic change of cultural policy. Of course, not only within the described context of working conditions, but also in all areas mentioned at the beginning of my intervention. So let's show another world is possible in arts and culture. Thank you. That's it uh, from my <laughs> intervention. Mike, over to you. Please take the screen. Thanks, thanks very much, Tara. That was, that was great. I think the word precarity is probably something which has been with the arts and culture sector throughout most of the regions here and certainly in the 
in the continent that I am. And COVID has kind of just exacerbated it in a way. And if we have been resilient to this particular process, there's probably a whole lot that we can teach other sectors of our society. But thank you very much for that intervention. It's really been, really been great. Um, so, Ron, let's go to Turkey. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to be with yourselves this evening because we will most probably reach sometime around midnight, that part of uh, the participants. And um, I would like to uh, challenge some of our uh, ordinary lexicon uh, and then try to uh, maybe imagine altogether, maybe with this subsuing um, discussion, inventing and trying to find out new words. So I would start with a sentence. Before I started to learn Arabic, it, this was during the time of the Tahrir in uh, Cairo. We were having a meeting. I think Wafa was there, if I'm not mistaken. We were at the Goethe Institute in Cairo. And I started my intervention there by saying, because I know that we have Arab speaking friends and I will try to translate in English. It's only one sentence, something like Aluga Muhimma Jiddan, meaning the language is very important. And uh, the reason I'm saying that I feel that we have to find ourselves in a place to invent a new vocabulary to also designate and uh, get out of our position as we talked about precarity and so on. Let me give you two specific cases to illustrate what I think. I think it was more than 12 years ago, I was the director of a derelict power plant in Istanbul. Central Istanbul was the name and it was the uh, power plant of the Ottoman state. And for about 50 years, this was the only uh, energy provider to the city. And there in around end of 2008, we organized a meeting with uh, friends, colleagues coming from these countries, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Iran, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey. And the title of the conference of two days with workshops and so on was the Emerging Cultural Continent, Actors and Networks. So think of these countries where conflict, armed conflict, war, instability are the rule. While stability and uh, regular conduct of life is an exception. And we had this wonderful two days together and we published that book. And since then, when I see the time in between, nothing has changed, except that last year in February, things have suddenly come to a stop. I mean, even those of us or all of us who were thinking and criticizing what was going on, the so-called normal, which I don't call it because it was imposed to us to be normal, uh, stopped. And we could see that the life could be slower, that cities could be much more desert than they are. So, I mean, this was my first sensation that we have words to say from that part of the world creating a new vocabulary. And I will give a more recent case from a place which is also uh, very close to some of our friends here are from. This is from Rijeka, who was supposed to be a European capital of culture, which was canceled, simply. As many other things, as all went digital. And friends that decided to create something called Rijeka Underground, just to go on with resilience. And I'm very happy that they are mentioned about resilience because um, I personally would like to use and underline the word resilience versus sustainability, which is imposed also to us. Uh, now, 2021 is the year of UN for 
uh, creative industries for sustainable development. In a world where millions are deprived of work, vaccine, and the rest, it's not easy to talk about development. The crisis is becoming the rule. So I guess we have to find ways really to first get into the, the, each other's reality and try to liaise with each other, trying to learn or be in a process of peer learning. So I guess that these two cases, one from 2008 and another one from 2020 are very much important. In this respect, I would like to come to another point, which is the role of the nation states for cultural policy making. Because I was uh, involved in the civil society cultural policy making in Turkey with a group of more around 200 people back in 2010, despite being excluded from the national cultural policy review process of the Council of Europe, I think that we can take the initiative and be there. Because I feel not only the national state does not have enough resources to fund support and give incentives to culture, but I do believe that they don't want it. So there are two ways which could be very useful for us for the future. One is becoming genuinely local, liaising with local communities. And the other one is getting more and more transborder and liaising with our peers. And when I try to find out what is this group represents for us, the participants of the atelier this year, there is a word I want to not invent, it is there. This is the Mediterranean. Mediterranean with all the troubles, with all the wars, but all the civilization. And I don't mean a region geographically speaking. I mean a state of mind. I mean a world. And it is not necessarily that we should get together and uh, unite, but we can learn from each other for sure. And as we are uh, supposed to, I mean, also formulate provocations as it was requested from us for our intervention, I would say during uh, this atelier period, we can also learn from the participants and try to also change our lexicon for cultural policy making and art management because I feel that we have words to insert into this discussion and that we are also capable of that. And let me also um, maybe uh, resume my short talk that the new normal will never come. And now we have the duty of being very attentive on two things because it was always requested from us to look for the economic and social impact of what we were doing. This was the parameters of all project goals. And now I would like to add two more criteria. One is the hygiene, the health risk issue. And not necessarily with masks or, or not, but generally speaking, because we cannot lose the earth. And second is the ecological footprint. And this is becoming much more decisive and outstanding for also the resilience, which doesn't mean that we cannot oscillate because as it is happening around the world for social and economic issues, the gap 
between the poors of the world and the little tip out of the uh, water, the rich is becoming more and more deeper. And I'm afraid the same will happen in the art world between the independence and the mainstream. Thank you. Thanks, Clive, Saran. Thank you very much for that provocation. Um, you speak about the new vocabulary. I think it would be quite interesting if you can give us some examples of the new vocabulary. Obviously, you've mentioned a few things, but to come back later and, and, and hear what that is in real terms, it's a little bit like if we build it, they will come. Is it true that if we say it, it will be? Um, so we look forward to engaging around that a little bit later. Let's then move on to Tunisia, to Wafa Belgesem. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody, for offering me this opportunity to join. And it's really hard to talk now just after Serhan. I mean, Mike, next time, put me before him. Um, so um, uh, there is very little to add to what has been said before me. But maybe I am here. With, I will focus on the, the, the context in Tunisia and the experience we have been since the revolution plus uh, the COVID uh, situation. So I will um, talk, uh, put my thoughts in three big, uh, how to say, pillar. The bad, the good, and the business as usual. So the bad in Tunisia since the revolution, or I don't know how many, six or seven ministers for the Ministry of Culture. And since the COVID, which is, let's say, started in March, February, March to now, it's one year, we had one minister, one interim minister, and now we have a wannabe minister because we have an appointed minister, but who cannot take over his position and his functionality because there is, um, how to say, a leadership and ego fight between the head of the government and the president of the. So he has been designated as a minister, but before to be officially and properly a minister, he needs to, you know, the say the oath before uh, the president, who did not provide this appointment to those ministers to uh, confirm their appointment. So we are in a hanging situation with an administration that's in charge of uh, the whole ecosystem because Tunisia, since its independence, has a very strong and very important role that the government has played in the development and survival of the cultural creative uh, let's say the cultural sector as a whole. So that's one of the bad. The bad also are the cuts that we already had. I mean, which is Tunisia in terms of uh, the percentage of allocation of public budget to the Ministry of Culture is one of the champions in the region. We, uh, at the time of the revolution, we have almost, I think we have already reached the 1% of the total uh, budget of the, the government budget. But then it's, it's going back and back and back, and there are cuts and more and more. Also, and this is, um, I don't think it's specific to Tunisia, but when you're in the global south and then in developing country and in stable, like Tunisia since 2011, we are what's called in the um, post-conflict uh, uh, phase with a total instability, a total invisibility, actually. On, on, on what's going on and the total fragility. So the COVID, now I move to the business as usual. So this instability, uh, living with the uncertainty and what people use the word, uh, I heard resilience. I prefer word proper to Africa, which is called le système D. And we are a champion, it's the plan D. Not, all, not, not A, B, C, we have learned to work with, go after D because we are the master of find a solution, deal with it, and then that's the business as usual for us. But what changes with the COVID is the intensity of it. I mean, the, the, the level. And, uh, and the third, now I move to the good. So the good in what's happening, it's, it's the innovation. I mean, we've been forced to go faster and find solution, react to the situation, and not only innovation in terms of having its economic, um, finding economic solution, it's, it's 
innovation and how you structure, how you react, that was good in what's, what has happened now. Uh, if I take the case of Tunisia, a group, let's call it the COVID-19 uh, uh, Alliance, Advocacy Alliance, that was born uh, in, in, in reaction to that situation. And I think in some cases, it pushed us to more fast pace toward uh, maturity in terms as a sector and an ecosystem. We have learned the hard way, the importance of, guys, we need to organize, we need to unite. I mean, changing whether the, the, the relationship balance, whether it is with our own government or the international cooperation uh, system, it's time we learn that no, nothing's gonna happen if we don't work together, if we don't structure what we're trying to do. Um, and I want to provoke what has been said before. Uh, virtual is good. Uh, when you are an artist in the middle of a small village in Tunisia, where access to visibility to the, mar uh, let's say between the, the audiences, the, the market outside of Tunisia, it's almost impossible for you because you will never ever have the chance to afford, not even for financial reasons, but for the mobility uh, challenges to go and meet audience to be visible. So this online thing, actually it has uh, shaken uh, the dominance relationship of visibility, of accessibility. Um, so um, I see it good. Uh, the, 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 even for performing arts, I think if you take someone, a, a young artist with the little support mechanism that's available here in my country, and they would offer a live streaming the, um, a, a platform for him to be visible, to connect, to talk to other people from other and other actors, from other ecosystems, beside the impossibility of it, I would say for him that's good. Like, between nothing and something, for some categories, it's good. Um, and also, uh, in terms of uh, sustainability, of uh, I think also what's happening now, um, it also will force people to think about, okay, there is something to learn from people who has been doing this before, not by choice, but by, um, by how to say, um, par, uh, par default. So what you said earlier, Sirhan, it's really interesting and it, it resonates with me a lot uh, in terms of um, uh, eco being um, ecologic and respect the environment. Um, a lot of to learn in countries like ours in the global south where you can create, I mean, the, the relationship to uh, professionalism and how you do things will, must change the perception of um, uh, the, the service or the performance uh, must have to change now, and it's changing. So um, I will stop here because we can keep the discussion later. This is that the different thing that I bring to, to what we have been said earlier. Great, thank you, Afa. There's no need to put you before Sir Han. You have enough content and passion to go at any point in the order. So thank you very much for, for your contribution as well. And then the final contribution from our panel is from Omar um, in Beirut. Hello, thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of those, round, uh, those panels with uh, the Festival Academy, because while hearing you speaking, I had this impression that I'm in a safe space. I'm between friends. And in these harsh times, it's uh, important to be uh, in those kind of spaces because uh, we're not uh, having a very nice time here in Beirut. It's, I, I was very hesitant to accept the invitation to be on that table. I accepted it because I wanted to be among colleagues and uh, people uh, who still believe that culture is a space that should exist. And in Lebanon nowadays, after the revolution, the inflation, 
uh, in uh, less than a year, uh, uh, the Lebanese dollar have inflated in more than 600%. More than 60% of the population went under the stage of poverty. Uh, the Beirut blessed. Uh, the middle class is not even like struggling middle class now, it's like poor people. Uh, and let's not speak about culture where everything in culture is suspended not only because of the COVID, because we all the time find solution for culture and alternative like online, and we all the time find solutions. Uh, but in Lebanon recently, one week ago, uh, one of our producers who produced a play in our festival and was a producer in our festival, uh, was assassinated because of his political uh, uh, political uh, opinions. His political opinions were, were very clear uh, against Hezbollah, but uh, mainly against uh, the fact that uh, you can make culture in the middle of Beirut suburbs, Beirut suburbs that are the headquarters of Hezbollah, and he built it a cultural space in those Beirut suburbs. So this cultural space was continuously under attacks and under threat during the last 10 years, until two weeks ago, they decided uh, to assassinate him. So Luqman Slim who was uh, one of the co-founder of uh, Umam, uh, uh, Umam for uh, documentation and research, who produced our play that was presented in our festivals two years ago. Uh, the play was with former Lebanese prisoners in uh, Syrian jails, which is a huge taboo in Lebanon because you cannot speak about uh, Syrian jails, you cannot speak about former Lebanese prisoner in film, uh, Syrian jail, who is the director and uh, producer of the movie Tedmor, was assassinated. It could sound like something very normal in our part of the world, considering culture, to assassinate somebody who have a free speech, who, but the impact of it the fact that in Lebanon nowadays, you can not speak about something. You cannot say whatever you want. You cannot anymore receive uh, foreign uh, production. That means you cannot anymore receive production from Germany. You cannot anymore receive from production from the US. You cannot anymore seek any money from a European country without being, as a cultural operator, being threatened of being uh, uh, a special agent with agendas, have a huge impact nowadays on, I'm not going to speak about free speech, I'm going to speak about culture, I'm going to speak about comics, because there is no money coming to Lebanon, which it should be the haven of free speech and culture in the Middle East, that, that uh, is not uh, being uh, convicted of being, uh, uh, of having agendas. So now in Lebanon, and I think for my, um, on my opinion, in the whole Middle East, and also in the whole world, if you want to speak of it, there is a war of cult on culture. There is a war on safe space for reflection outside of the media world, outside of the, uh, of the speeches of politicians. And it's becoming a reality. If today you want to make a festival, and if this festival is outside of the agendas of your country, 
it's impossible. In Lebanon, that have always been considered as an experimental space that later on was going, is going to be reproduced on the region and later on on the world, we are unable nowadays without being afraid for our life. Like we, we can uh, see uh, that two weeks ago, one of our producers, Lukman was assassinated, are unable to make a theater festival, are unable to make a movie, are un uh, unable even to archive the history of our country. We are threatened or we are killed. I think we, not only Lebanon is in a cultural crisis, but the whole world shutting up on this situation is in crisis. The fact that uh, today uh, I'm obliged to adapt not only uh, my festival or my plays, because I'm a theater director, I'm a play director, and I'm a, uh, I'm a festival director. I'm obliged to rethink in my mind 10 times the content of my festival, of my plays, of, uh, of uh, my space policies, 10 times because I'm afraid of my life. That means that not only culture in Lebanon is in crisis, but culture in the whole world is in crisis. And it's not a Zoom problem. It's not a virtual uh, world problem against uh, the physical world problem. It's paradigm problem. What paradigms are going to rule the world for the 2,000 years that are going to come. We are living today, uh, we lived for the last 2,000 year, uh, 2000 year, uh, 2000 year on the basis of so-called democracy, socialism, that was built on Hel Hellenistic paradigms that were built in 400 before Jesus Christ uh, uh, through theater, through performing art, through mythology, through poetry, that means through festival, through culture. This is what are creating today's festival, today's culture. Today, all those paradigms are in danger because the, the world is the word W-O-R-D is in danger because we are being assassinated uh, because of what we are saying. Uh, it was very difficult for me to accept this invitation because I had two options, either saying what I'm saying or doing the, uh, the, uh, the, the talk that we usually say, okay, uh, we in Lebanon are not well, and we want to be resilient, and we want, and we will continue. Today, I don't know if we, if we will continue. Uh, for us today, the struggle as cultural operators, as artists, is just to be present, just to exist. And my question for you is not, what content or what, uh, uh, what, <laughs> what programmation, or to, uh, what action should we do? But as how can we be present? Not in just in our context, but all of us together is how can we be present? How can we make a festival without being another festival with an excellent programmation or how to make a festival with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, a content that is politically relevant, but how to make a festival where we can all be present, pre present sorry, together in a place that 
our presence means something against everything that want to attack culture. I hope I made sense and I am thankful for your listening. Amal, thank you for your contribution. Um, it's, I've heard you a number of times in different forums and it's always such an emotional experience because the reality from within which you speak is one which you know, really speaks to the visceral within us, not just our intellects, but you're a theater maker and, and you have a way of, of reaching us beyond simply, simply our minds. So thank you for that. But I think that all of the presentations collectively have thrown up particular themes, which I think we all kind of need to be considering at this time. And this is exactly what the purpose of this panel was. How do we reflect upon the current conditions in which we find ourselves in the world, yes, but also within the regions that are represented here? And what does that mean for our collaboration, for our being in solidarity with each other? And I think that there are probably, in summary, four particular things that seem to have emerged. The one is about the closure of political space how political space is closing for freedom of expression to kind of happen, but also how volatile the political space is with ministers in charge of arts and culture, as um, Wafa was referring to earlier, the conflicts between civil society and um, the arts and culture sector and the politicians who are responsible for those sectors and what this means in terms of policy making and how policy then impacts on what it is that arts and culture people are able to do because funding follows policy. The second thing that seems to have emerged out of these discussions is the impact of COVID on the economics of arts and culture, the decline in funding, not just within arts and culture, but within our societies generally, but particularly people have found the, the artistic space becoming more and more precarious over the last over the last ten months. Related to the declining funding and the impact of COVID on people's jobs and so on, is the third theme that seems to have emerged, and that is the growing inequality in the world, but also within our regions and within our countries. And what does growing inequality mean when people do not have the means to be able to engage in and participate in culture. And here we are at a policy level talking about creative industries, for example, and creative industries meaning that we are producing products for sale and when many people no longer have a disposable income to access what it is that we are offering in terms of these neoliberal policies that Gia kind of reference, what does that mean for the role and impact of arts and culture in this kind of current space? But the final thing that seems to have emerged, and that was something coming both from Dia and from Wafa as well, is that there's growing um, organization within the arts and culture space, where there's increasing kind of recognition within arts and culture practitioners that unless they are organized and are beginning to advocate strongly for their sector and within these unfolding conditions, we will always kind of be victims in a way and we need to have our voices heard and so on. So those are, are four things which I kind of took from the presentations that, that came from this. If you're wanting to ask any questions in the chat, please feel free to do so, and I'll kind of reference it to the speaker that you are wanting to address. But I wanted to maybe just begin by asking a couple of questions today. I wonder if we can maybe start with you. You spoke about the context which has emerged in post, I suppose, um, post-1989 Croatia and generally Eastern Europe and the paradigm of, of, of capitalism, how that has impacted upon the precarity that arts and culture people find themselves in. You also spoke about this new world, so Ryan was speaking about new vocabulary and the like. Structurally though, and in terms of the system that we live within, 
how possible is it to create a new world or to be a new world as arts and culture practitioners within that? How much do we need to negotiate the world that we are in as opposed to living parallel to it? What, what are you kind of proposing as a way forward for arts and culture practitioners? You think, Mike, that I have a recipe? Um, of course. I don't think, I but I was have. hoping that you would, because <laughs> I think we're all <laughs> facing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So this is the question for all of us. You know, what what is the recipe for all that situation, and especially what Omar shared with us uh, uh, after uh, his speech? It's really difficult, you know, to come back uh, uh, to to other topic and uh, and talk about uh, uh, all that different layers, uh, which all of basically produced uh, in the political space. So. Uh, the politicians are the one who basically created uh, everything what we took in the last uh, uh, hour from different perspectives, talking about accessibility and equalities, the climate issues and the sustainability, pollution, uh, and this old problems and impediments or new problems which appears with the corona and the COVID, uh, tackling the issue of uh, uh, safe uh, uh, and, and, uh, and the health, uh, closed border, closed cultural venues, absence of physical experiences, and so on and so on. But uh, to come back basically, Mike, to your questions, what would be uh, how to say uh, the, 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 the suggestion uh, so, or solution for the future, it's really difficult to say. But uh, uh, in one line, I think I'm not looking for a new uh, uh, vocabulary or a new lexicon, as, as Sarhan uh, asked earlier. I'm looking for a changes of our behavior in a total, including us in arts and culture, who are part of the whole systemic, uh, or, or of the whole neoliberal system or capitalism uh, in which we live in majority of, of, of countries and the Croatia is one of that countries uh, uh, which is a part of the third wave of democracy uh, and we experience a lot of uh, uh, like a failness of, uh, of and deficit of that democracy such as the corruptions, crimes, creation of the political elites and all of that basically influences our life including the arts and culture which is a part, as I said, of the neoliberal system. And we use the same patterns which we criticize within the arts and cultural practices. And this is something what I'm uh, asked to change in our sense of how we operate, how we think in, in different area, you know, starting from uh, uh, climate issues, for example, you know, what does it mean in arts and culture? In many, uh, many uh, discussion, we usually uh, talk about these relations between the climate uh, uh, changes and arts and culture from the perspective that the arts can increase the awareness of the climate change, but we in many we really rare speak about what we have to change in artistic and cultural practices in order to become more, you know, awareness of the climate change within the sector. So this is the the basically the main. It's not the recipe. It's a principle of changing ourselves. Uh, in different aspects, you know, and changing the policy, the public policy. And this is, you know, something what is uh, like, um, it's, a, it's, it's uh, always uh, uh, resonate to Foucault and what uh, uh, he talked about, uh, you know, not only about the, 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 the whole policy arena, then what we can do in, on our daily basis with our policy action within our behavior to change, you know, or to make a changes, to advocate for, for a changes. Yeah, that's kind of one of those, those real challenges at the same time that one 
lives and works within a particular system and needs to survive within that system. So you kind of, in some ways, play to that system's rules at the same time as trying to change it. It's a, it's an interesting kind of position to be in, particularly when the arts and culture sector is so precarious and is 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 kind of just needing to survive at the same time as trying to change the macro conditions so that its survival is kind of more sustainable into the future. But thank you for that. Michal, I wanted to come uh, to you. you. You kind of occupy quite an interesting position out of the speakers here in the sense that you are kind of quasi government in the sense that, you know, your position and what it is that you are doing is funded by the public sector. Um, and you were speaking about the declining funding that has occurred over the last while. Most folk that are probably participants here um, operate within a civil society kind of space. And I just wondered how you um, negotiate that space between, on the one hand, and having to negotiate with politicians and those responsible for policy and public funding on the one hand to make sure that your project happens, and at the same time, kind of trying to take care of an increasingly vulnerable um, arts and culture sector. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. <clears throat> I, I have to declare from the very beginning that I do not have the solution for that. Uh, we are striving to. And um, because this, the first reality we confront is an objective reality in terms that uh, there was a budget for, for LFC's uh, cap, uh, European Capital of Culture 2021, and then we have been postponed without having new funds for that. Um, that's the one thing. Uh, we have to negotiate with politicians and with the municipality, but there is also another indirect way of pushing it, focusing on programs that obviously uh, improve uh, the daily face of the city itself. Because it's not, it's not only using art forms and, and, um, and cultural or artistic programs, but using them also as a tool to exert a push, a pressure to the state uh, and to the municipal institutions toward, toward a direction where can make the city itself blossom in, in another level of uh, economy, which is the, the, let's call them the fourth pillar, which is the, 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 the cultural economy because it has assets this city to flourish on that level. So one way what we're, we're ahead to is also, and we like that, we want that um, in, in, in any way, even if we didn't conform, if we didn't face this, uh, this uh, cut of, uh, of funds, um, is to focus on actions and projects that improve the, the daily life of the citizens. And this is something that they have to be able to experience directly. And that's, that's a political push, I would say, using the, that, that's the only answer I could give for now, for this moment. Okay, um, and, and we're not expecting everyone to just have the answers. Part of having an atelier like this is placing some of the questions on the table so that we can grapple with them over the time that we have together. And this is one of the beautiful things about an atelier is bringing people from different kinds of experiences or with different insights, different backgrounds, and they're able to help us to work through these questions together. I want to do to then maybe go on to, to Saran. Um, interestingly, Mikhail was talking about the fourth pillar of culture, of, of sustainable development being culture. You didn't mention culture as being one of the four pillars of sustainability. You spoke about the economy, about social impact, you spoke about ecology, and you spoke about health in a broader sense. But you did not speak about culture as the fourth pillar of sustainability, which is what Agenda 21 and so on kind of speak about. Is that for a particular reason? Is that part of your new vocabulary, new language? Well, yes, because um, for, for me... Sorry, I mean, Mikhail, Mikhail, sorry. sorry, that was a question. Okay, sorry, good. No worries. 
Sinomi, uh, I think uh, yeah. you you are reciprocating my provocation, and thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I mean, it's very uh, mind opening. Uh, I mean, of course, I am also an expert of the Agenda 21 for Culture, and I worked a lot in Turkey for the adoption and the um, ratification of the famous 2005 convention and so on. But uh, I feel that it is almost useless to push forward to include in one of those uh, very famous uh, 17 goals and 169 targets, the culture, because target is like our daily life. Uh, it's like uh, part of being alive. That is why uh, I think that we have to say that culture is transversal to the whole idea of resilience. I wouldn't say sustainability because um, I'm very much becoming uh, to the opinion that this, the so-called system is in agony. Of course, the dying period, we cannot predict. It would take time and there will be convulsions before it gives up. But I feel that culture is part of our daily life. And this, uh, I want to thank Omar for his very genuine uh, coming from the soul talk. Because now I'm working on a kind of a retrospective of an artist born in Beirut and who today turned 96, namely Etel Adnan, whom I'm translated into Turkish and then uh, we will have the show in Istanbul. And she, at some point when she wrote the so-called Arab apocalypse, she said that the world has gone out and she's still with us. But the person who published her books in San Francisco passed away, Ferlinghetti. So the reason I'm telling that, because you would recall, Mike, I think, when we had this panel of the uh, theater cooperative in Istanbul, through, together with IETM, I said that Lebanon, we have to watch very carefully what's going on there, because I feel that Lebanon is the epicenter of the world to come. And Omar has reconfirmed my sensation that really we have to look very carefully to what's going on because uh, we are in a world, we can feel our friends in India, in Latin America. And when I said Mediterranean, this is a state of mind, this is not geographical. Otherwise a foundation with the name of a Swedish minister, Anna Lindt, would not be about the Mediterranean. I mean, I have two things maybe to say. First, we have to deal with politics while we are doing culture. And we have to deal with policy while we are doing culture. This is the only way we can survive and keeping also our contact with our peers, our colleagues. I wouldn't use the word maybe solidarity, but I would use re collective resilience. And this is the way maybe we can go back to one century ago and use the word to be a candidate for hegemony. Good. So that's the new vocabulary. Instead of solidarity, we now speak about collective resilience. <laughs> Thanks very much, Saran. You spoke about um, Lebanon, so maybe let's go to Omar in Lebanon. Omar, what, what you were speaking about is, is very um, much the kind of thing that resonates with us here in the African continent as well. What tends to happen is that our very authoritarian governments do not support arts and culture because they fear contemporary artistic practice and freedom of expression. And then when arts and culture organizations and practitioners get money from abroad, they accuse them of being agents of foreign change and the like, because, and, and so it's like the sketch 22 situation, they kind of almost set you up in a way 
to do to do things um, you know like that. So so I wanted to ask, insofar as a lot of what happens in Lebanon has been dependent upon international funding in the past, would these kinds of new restrictions that are happening, how does the arts and culture sector survive? How do they fund themselves? What sources of and streams of income do they have access to? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question, Mike. It's very rare actually to have clever questions from facilitators. So I'm very happy to have you as a facilitator who ask clever questions. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, not, it's not a fake compliment. Anyway, uh, I, th I, I will take the question, even though it's very clever, I will take it from a, another point. Uh, I think us as cultural operator, as artists, as uh, people, uh, as amateurs of art, I just want to speak as amateurs of art, we have a, an inferiority complex thinking that art is not a political uh, reflection. We, as cultural operator, have to rethink that culture is in the middle of politics. If it's not the middle of politics, it's even politics in itself. How to reflect about the world, how to reflect about beauty, how to reflect about dialectics, is the politics. When there is cuts on arts and culture in European country, you can smell fascism coming from kilometers away. Because there is a fight, there is a war on culture coming from our contemporary uh, politicians on arts and culture because they know they do not cut funds on arts and culture in the US, in, the, uh, in Europe, in the Middle East because they consider they are stupid and they do not know that arts and culture is necessary. They know that art and culture is a threat on them, on them. You can sense it in France, you can sense it in Germany, you can sense it in Italy. Whatever, whenever they make a cut on culture and arts, they are making cuts on opposition and opposition on fascism. Because it's not about fascism and leftism. They're making a cut on critical thinking. And there is a war on us. It's clear. And it's whenever they say we are funding European countries, whenever they say there is funds for education and there is no fund for art and culture, they are saying there is funds for brainwashing and there is no fund for critical thinking. Oh. I read an article today about how education in uh, the US is based on tax uh, on property. You understand the whole logic, logic of liberalism and capitalism. I'm not defending socialism. I'm not a socialist. I'm not a communist. I'm just a person who's saying that there is, a, there is no space anymore today for critical thinking. And critical thinking is culture. And the ability, the, your right to look at the Caravaggio, your right to look at the play, your right to go to a theater, uh, is is not anymore uh, 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 an institutional right. It's resistance because they allow you in Lebanon. They allow you to go to a church, to a mosque, but they don't allow you to go to theater. They allow you to go to casi casinos, 
they don't allow you to go to a theater. Because and there's the same Omar. case in many European countries. Uh, yeah. Sure. Sorry. Sorry to cut you in, but we've got about five minutes before we need to end because there's a cultural program that starts. But thank you very much for your contributions. And we do want to, over the next couple of days, also look at the challenges that you presented to us. How can we be present? Something which Mikhail has also kind of suggested that we do. So we'll talk about that over the next couple of days. But I just wanted to end and ask Wafa a question that may be more a little bit um, optimistic, hopefully. Um, just because of the position that she is in as someone who monitors the funding of culture. Um, Wafa, because we, in terms of our collaborations, and we've been speaking about the decline in funding and that, is there anything that you've noticed over the last while in terms of funding for culture from your position that we should be optimistic about? Yes, but just before that, I want to build on the resilience. So we all agree in this discussion that we need to be resilient, that there is the reflection to be done there. But I mean, the what, we all agree. However, I have the feeling that the understanding, resilience, it's not an attitude. It's not a training you do it. The resilience is a strategy that it's put in place over a long term. The resilience is to prepare for shocks. So, and I think we've been a little bit responsible uh, for that because in some, I mean, in some context, the decision, I mean, the choices for us as a sector to, 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 to um, um, uh, I'd say not impose, but to, to put ourselves in the center and defend our cause was, yeah, government don't fund, we, they, you have to fund, but we have never prepared the plan B. Resilience is about having a plan B. And then I think we need to think of resilience, not a recipe or not something, a capacity. It's not a capacity, actually. It's a strategy. It's many things you put here and there so you become resilient. It's a multitude of plan Bs. That's one thing. Now, about to answer your questions on the optimistic, yes. I mean, yeah, uh, people would hate me because I'm like, uh, uh, I'm old, but I'm so fond of what's coming out with this new technology and these gross things. For me, it's like toys. And then um, I see the good in everything. And actually, yeah, this, this, this virtual world offer us opportunity to um, be solidaire, exchange, help each other with minimum need for money. Being online and this new technology, it can help people in anywhere else building their resilience, financial resilience strategies. Um, these online things have opened a new resource opportunities for other kinds of artists. This, this, for example, in Tunisia for a very long time, it's impossible for an art, basically impossible for an artist to get paid online or doing something online or thing. Now, during the COVID, we have, I can name them, we have a clink which offer a payment for live streaming and live performance. Uh, we have uh, Bakshish, I just described it, Bakshish is tips. And it's a platform that allows artists to offer their services and their activity and be paid by mobile. It's quite rare in Tunisia. And the third one is Shakaha, which is a kind of the local crowdfunding thing. So that's the technology offer also the opportunity for us to be solidaire. Great. Thank you very much for that as well. It's eight, it's uh, basically 9.29 where I am, 8.29 in Brussels and probably a bit later in other places. Um, so thank you very much to the panelists, uh, Mikhail, Saran, Dea, Omar and Wafa for your provocations. It's been really great um, at this time of the evening to have and to be stimulated by you. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much uh, for being here and for doing that. Um, now over to Inga, just to let us know what happens next. Well, first to conclude the live stream, we'll, we'll be back tomorrow at 11 CET Brussels time with um, a next panel. Uh, so see you tomorrow.